Welcome Global Change Makers to another episode of Chat SDG. Today we have the privilege of hosting a distinguished guest, Dr. Alexa White, whose expertise draws from her work with academia and sustainability. Dr. White's impactful work not only aligns with the Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs, but serves as a guiding light in our shared journey towards a more sustainable and equitable future. In this episode, we dive deep into the intersection of Dr. White's research and the SDGs, exploring the threads that connect academic inquiry with real world solutions. Uh, so without further ado, let's extend a warm virtual welcome to our esteemed guest, Dr. Alexa White. Hi, Dr. Alexa, how are you? Hi, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Right, then diving straight into our questions, uh, uh, Dr. White, given your expertise in agroecology and sustainable farming, how can we address the climate impact of agriculture sector, which contributes significantly to global carbon emissions? Of course. So a large part of the reason why agriculture participates in carbon emissions is because of land use change. It wasn't until the last 15 to 10 years that we started to understand the differences between uh, clearing land and what emissions were coming from, for example, livestock. And so uh, when you create a farm, it's necessary to get rid of all of the things that suck the carbon out of the atmosphere, trees. Um, and that participates significantly to the world's carbon emissions. Um, we can also see through history that industrial uh, farming methods, such as using pesticides and different fertilizers and kind of only having monocultural arrangements has produced a lot more carbon emissions than we've seen um, uh, uh, during the Green Revolution and um, during uh, colonialism. So um, a significant way that we can um, think about moving forward is to change those into sustainable methods. That is the way forward. And uh, Dr. White, as an advocate for food sovereignty, what role do you see for community-driven solutions in achieving a fairer world for indigenous people and as envisioned by the EDFU Foundation. Yeah, so a lot of um, the issue with uh, carbon emissions that come from the agricultural sector are due to political regulations and um, a misunderstanding between farmer scientists and politicians. So in terms of food sovereignty, um, a fairer world would require us to give uh, indigenous people, indigenous farm workers, the platform to advocate for their traditional methods. Um, specifically through the Ed Food Foundation, um, we try to uh, empower those that um, are typically uh, marginalized from these spaces. So a lot of my experience is on the international stage, specifically at Conference of Parties. And so um, the majority of the people doing those negotiations are not indigenous people, they are not farmers. Um, and that has to change in order for us to even um, validate the existence of these issues. Thank you very much for shedding light on this very important subject of food sovereignty. It is very new for, for some regions of the world. Thank you very much for introducing this subject. All right. So moving on from a uh, subject of food sovereignty to you, uh, your role as a mentor, uh, how do you nurture diversity among scientific leaders and promote democratization of scientific knowledge? So I come from a family of sharecroppers. So um, I uh, have always been uh, around agriculture and understanding what it how it relates to my background and my upbringing. But um, as soon as I started to try and apply that to science, I realized that science is generally a, an ivory tower. Um, Western ideologies of science have typically um, been very exclusionary. The, the words that are used, the way that we go about conducting the science is not very conducive for every Everyone to understand. And so in order to promote the democ democratization of scientific knowledge, um, I founded, uh, uh, along with uh, my co-founder, Adrian Peterkin, um, the IO Research Institute. Um, and so that's meant to increase the amount of uh, people of color involved in science and, and engineering research, um, spe specifically regarding food sovereignty and environmental justice. 
And so as a mentor, we really um, look to our fellows better understand how to integrate community uh, um, impacts and community perspectives into their research. We really like to um, emphasize the importance of um, applied science and engineering. Uh, your work spans so many regions and distinct environmental challenges. How can global climate policy be better informed by localized agricultural practices and community needs? Can you shed some light on that, please? So um, each landscape is very unique and different. Um, if we think about farming and food, there are seasonality uh, uh, things that we should pay attention to. There's differences in the crops that we can grow um, according to the soil composition. And um, these differences are really important when we're thinking about the future of climate change. So we know the climate change impacts are happening today, but when we think about global climate policy, it can't be a blanket statement. Um, there's not something that can be uh, a fix all for everyone. Um, and so agricultural practices and community needs are, are very unique to um, these small uh, municipalities and smaller communities that um, uh, are all over the world. And so when we think about global climate policy, the only um, body that tends to make um, global climate policy um, publicly is the, uh, the United Nations, specifically the UNFCCC. So at the Conference of Parties, um, there's negotiations that happen. Um, the Paris Climate Accord um, was a really big um, improvement. And then we had um, the Loss and Damages Fund that was created um, at, COP20, uh, at uh, COP in Egypt. And so in order for us to be informed uh, for those um, kinds of venues, we have to invite people from the community, invite farmers, invite agriculturalists into those spaces. Without communities, other institutions become redundant. Without inclusive nature of communities, other institutions remain defunct. It is most important and that is keeping in mind our next question to you, uh, Dr. White, considering the nexus between environmental justice and climate change, what innovation, innovative solutions and policies can bridge the knowledge gaps and enhance the effectiveness of tools like EPA's EJ screen addressing the environmental justice issues? Environmental justice is something that, at least within the United States, is a kind of a new concept. Um, I would say that around the world, I've seen the term used in um, uh, different ways or uh, through different language. But uh, the ways that we can bridge uh, the solutions and policies is by understanding exactly what we're going to be using tools for. So a lot of my work focuses on environmental justice screening tools. And by that, it's an assessment of what is going to happen where or what is happening where. So for example, if we are to uh, assess a piece of land and understand that the soil is contaminated with heavy metals, as well as the air is contaminated with um, different pollutants, what does that mean for the people that are living there? Um, and so the big problem with environmental justice screening tools um, in the United States is that we don't really understand how multiple factors influence an individual. And so we call those cumulative impacts. Um, so by better understanding cumulative impacts and figuring out the algorithms by which we can um, better predict and understand how one individual is in, uh, impacted by multiple um, impacts, we can uh, better figure out uh, how to use these tools more effectively. On top of that, um, we really don't have a, a good um, measure of best practices for how we should be using these tools. Um, my opinion um, is that we should be using multiple tools in order to pinpoint um, solutions and give us direction. Um, and it's also uh, important for us to think about how these tools will be used in policy. So when we think about environmental justice policy making, um, usually there has to be some sort of metric. And so far, the only metric that we have that's widespread and um, generally accepted is environmental justice screening tools. So there's still a lot of work to be done, um, but uh, the improvement of these tools is the first and foremost.
and there you have it folks our heartfelt thanks to dr alexa white for sharing her knowledge passion and commitment to sustainability with us we've navigated through the realms of academia and looked at what are the various tools that are used to achieve sustainable development goals even in communities that we uh, assume are far advanced than us there is a lot of learning in today's session as we conclude this this enriching conversation let's carry forward the inspiration and insights gained today in our daily lives and conversations please share this video with your peers and uh, thank you all viewers for being part of this episode do not forget to like share and subscribe to stay tuned for more thought provoking discussions until next time keep the conversation live keep striving for positive change and keep those sdgs at the forefront of your endeavors this is bhuvan signing off namaskar